Well, welcome back to our study of 1 Timothy and then 2 Timothy. We are almost done with the first letter. Today we're going to be looking at the sixth chapter in four different lessons, and Paul is beginning to come to the end of his instructions for Timothy. Uh, when we last were together, Paul had given instructions to Timothy to three different groups of people so far. He had given one general instruction to the men and women, the younger men, the, the younger women, the older men, and the older women. Then he had looked at a specific group of people, the widows, and gave him instructions on, well, if they're not old enough or their family can't take care of them, then you can bring them on as the prayer warriors of your church. And then when we last left off, Paul gave Timothy instructions on the elders, how they should be honored or how they should be disciplined if they continue in sin. Well, there's one group of people that are left, and they are the slaves, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But let me ask you a couple of questions first. Now, those of you in the class, many of you are younger, but for those who might be watching on the camera or on the video, uh, if you are an employer and you have people working for you, here's a question for you. Have you found it easier to have employees who are Christians or employees who are not Christians? It's an interesting question that I wonder about in our culture in America, and I have friends in our church who are business owners or employers? And I would say that the answer to the question is sometimes, unfortunately, non-believer employees are better workers than the Christian employees. And you say, it shouldn't be that way. It should be that the Christian employee is a better worker and complains less and does better work than the non-Christian employee. But sometimes if the Christian is a boss or the Christian is the employer, Sometimes the Christian employee takes advantage of that relationship. Well, he's a brother in Christ, so I don't have to kind of work so hard, or I don't have to have this kind of pressure. So it's an interesting question to think about, and one that will be addressed in these first two verses of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. The kind of person that we are when we work for someone else is a reflection of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And what happens is those relationships end up affecting the church. If there is a work relationship between a boss and an employee that is not healthy, and both of those people go to the same church, it affects the health of the church. And all of those elements end up having an effect on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I say over and over and over again, for Paul, the gospel is everything. His proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it transforms a life and how we become a follower of Jesus Christ, that means everything to Paul because it meant everything to him personally, and that became his passion as he shared it with Timothy and the word went out to these churches. So this fourth and final category of people that Paul talks to Timothy about, he's talking about slaves and slave owners. Uh, and because our particular issue is not slavery, and I'll explain in a minute how this actually relates to those of us who work for employers, whether or not our boss is a Christian or not. So let me first of all explain something about slavery back in the first century. What was happening is as these slaves were becoming Christians, their new identity meant that they are new in Christ and that they were actually equal to their slave owners. So there created some confusion in the church as to how those interactions would work. For, for example, let me give you this statistic. 50% of all of the entire population of the Roman Empire were slaves. 50%, half of them. So those of us who grew up in cultures, in America, we had a culture of slavery a couple of hundred years ago that we had to break from. And so the percentage there, I don't think it was 50%, but in the Roman Empire, 50%, and they estimated that that meant there were 50 million people who were slaves. Wow. Were they all slaves who were under persecution? Were they all slaves who were oppressed? Were they all slaves that were part of a, a racial degradation that looked down upon them? In some cases that was true, but in many cases it was not. That at least for those of us who are Americans, our viewpoint of slavery is different than what was actually true in the first century in the Roman Empire. Not completely, but partially. For example, half of the slaves were freed when they reached the age of 30. 
So they often ended up preferring to be slaves because there was a security in having this slave owner or this employer to work for. And they would say, you know, at the age of 30, I, I could be free. I can go out off on my own. But he said, I actually like my owner. And so I have decided to stay on with him. In fact, what it meant is that they could gain Roman citizenship through their employer or through their slave owner. So they would say, you know, there are many benefits to being a Roman citizen, so I'm just going to continue to work here. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that there were not abuses. There were. That the images that we have of slavery today and the oppression, certainly some of that was true. But as we paint the larger landscape of what it meant to be a slave in the first century, a lot of our impressions are inaccurate when placed upon them. That honestly, some of them worked well for the employee. In fact, a lot of them became educated. For example, if you wanted to become a doctor, you would say, um, my family doesn't have enough money to train me to let me go to school to become a doctor. So what I will do is I will indenture myself or enslave myself to an employer for seven years. And in return for my work for him, my employer, my slave owner, will help finance my education so that I can become a doctor. So some of those things, so you have a much broader picture of what slavery meant. So here they have the, the slaves and the slave owners. And culturally, there was this divide which could be here or it could be here. But when they came to Christ, then they became equal. In Christ, the slave owner and the slave themselves were now the same in Christ. And so as slaves came into these new churches, can we worship the same as our slave owner? Can we sit beside our slave owner? Then we go back to work on, on Monday morning or whatever their particular day of work is. Then does the, the difference step in place again? What are we supposed to think about the relationship between the slave and the slave owner? So what I'd like to do is read with you 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It reads like this. Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Let me put it in one phrase for you. If I could take these two verses and put them in one phrase, this is what I would say. Your service to men is really your service to God. Your service or your work toward men is really your service toward God. That if we can understand that perspective and what Paul is saying here, that the honor that the slave is to provide for their, their slave owner is a reflection of the honor that we give to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. What Paul is essentially saying in these two verses is this, that whether your boss is a Christian or a non-Christian, no matter what kind of boss you have, you serve them as if you are serving the Lord. Because some people would say, well, my boss is unfair. I don't like working for my boss. I wish I had a different one. I wish I could have a different slave owner. Paul would say to him, and the Lord would say to him, even if your boss is not godly, you are serving me as you serve them. That as you work, they may see Christ in you, and they may be one to Christ because of your honoring them. There were others who had very good and godly bosses, and their, their joy and their pleasure was to serve them. But even then, their perspective was, I want you to serve the Lord, whether your boss is a believer or not a believer, because your life is a gospel witness. He says in verse 1, Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of honor. He doesn't say, unless... If your master is a good master, then honor him. He says, it doesn't matter. You are to honor those you work for, no matter what their relationship with God is. Why? So that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. It's the gospel. Suppose that you are a slave owner, and I'm your slave. 
And you know that I have become a follower of, of Jesus Christ. It's a new faith. It's a new religion. You don't know much about it. You're not a follower of Christ. You follow one of the many pagan religions. So I come and work for you, and, and I come to work, and, and you notice that I'm not getting my work done. Hmm. I told him that by the end of the week, he needed to have completed this project. It's the end of the week, and he's only done half of the work. It wasn't too much work. I didn't give him more work than he could do. I gave him a reasonable task, and he didn't do it. So you call me in, into your office, and you say, why did you not get the work done? And I say to you, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir, but I needed time to pray. I needed time to study the scriptures. So I took some of my work time and I studied the scriptures and I prayed. And that is my worship to God. And you look at me and you say, you what? I am, I am paying you to work for me and to get a job accomplished. You can practice your Christian faith anytime on your own, some other place, but not here. See, what you have done, even though you thought you were trying to practice a Christian faith, you were not doing, you were not honoring what your slave owner had asked you to do. See, there is a, re a sense in which you show them honor, irregardless of what kind of boss they are. You say, well, he doesn't treat me right, or he doesn't pay me enough, or, you know, if I had a better boss, then, then I would be glad to give him respect. Maybe that's a notion we should talk about for a minute, the, the idea of respect. There is some sense in which respect is earned, and there is another aspect where respect is simply given. Sometimes respect is earned over a period of time, that if you and I have a relationship, and at first we don't trust each other, that over time, as I get to know you, I give you more and more respect. But there are also situations where we meet someone, you say, because of the circumstances and because of your authority over me, I am simply going to give you my respect because of who you are or your place over me. Paul is essentially saying, now listen, no matter what kind of boss you have, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to give them your respect. I want you to give them your honor, whether or not they particularly deserve it, because it's always about the gospel. It says, again, I come back to that phrase, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. See, they might even look at you and say, well, I, I know what church they go to. If they're teaching in that church what is reflected in his work habits, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. Paul says, I want you, those of you who are slaves, to show honor and respect to those you work for so that the message of Jesus Christ will not have a stain against it. See, as I said before, how I act on my boss's time affects his view of who God is. People see Jesus Christ in me, and they may form a, a good impression or they may form a bad impression. Two theology students had jobs in which their unsaved boss would often see them talking about a variety of things. And he would observe them, and, and he knew that they were Bible college students. And so he watched them, and, and he wondered. And, and one time he watched the one student go into the restroom, and he didn't come out for 20 minutes. And when he came out, he saw him talking to the other young man, and he went over and he tried to listen without them noticing. And he said he heard them talking about, I had such a great time reading the scriptures and there as I, I hid myself. And the employer said, you're fired. Go home. I don't need people like you to work for me if that's the way you're going to work. I want you to work. See, they were not showing respect. Say, but I'm serving the Lord. I want to learn about God. Yes, but it's damaging the gospel witness of you as an individual, and it will damage the gospel witness of your church. I go back to something that Peter wrote in his first epistle when he said this, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He says they're going to accuse you of all kinds of things. They're going to say things about you that aren't even going to be true. But 
on the day that they become believers or on the day when they stand in judgment before God, all they can do is say, I just glorify you. I spoke against that person, but I had no, I had no grounds for doing so. I praise you, God, for who you are. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. What are some practical implications of this? Let's say that you are an employee for someone, whether he's a Christian or not a Christian. You say, how should I approach my work in a gospel-oriented way? Let me give you some suggestions, and maybe you can come up with some on your own. First, show up on time or early for work. If you and I are consistently coming late, that is a reflection of our honor or lack of honor for our employer. If they're saying, oh, you know, Joe actually does pretty good work, but I can't get him to come to work on time. I can't promote him. I can't give him a raise because I'm not sure that he, he's trustworthy enough. I think one gospel witness is for us simply to show up on time or even early. Let me give you a second. We need to demonstrate that no job is too small. So what do you mean by that? Sometimes those of us in, in higher positions, we say, you know, um, that job is too small for me. That, you know, that's something that one of the lesser employees could do. Uh, someone else can do that work. That, that's, that's far below me. I think that the gospel of Jesus Christ helps us understand humility. And as long as it doesn't distract from the overall work that we need to do, I think we need to display humility in our work in such a way that we say, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ in me, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to show honor to my boss. Third, my third suggestion is simply this. Pray and look for opportunities to meet their needs. So you begin a day, and I think of the verse that says, God has prepared works in advance for us to do. So sometimes with, when, our, when I'm with our people back in, in our church and we have a prayer meeting, I, I will say, Lord, I know that you already have prepared works for us to do. Help us to know them. Help us to find them. Help us to see them. I think you can pray the same thing in relationship to your employer. You can say, Father, you have something good for me to do that will be a gospel witness to him or to her. Will you show me what that is? Will you give me an opportunity? Maybe you can pray for opportunities to say something or to do something that would reflect the life of Jesus Christ in you. And I, I really, really believe that if we pray that prayer, God is going to say, I would be glad to answer that prayer. I will show you opportunities with your boss that will be a gospel witness to them. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.